You might be wondering why the heck is somebody from Southeast Michigan coming out and talking about health care on the west side of the state? And the answer is kind of uh, um, simple. I'm, in a, I'm on essentially what I call a free market health care evangelism tour. And we I first uh, kind of encountered it. My wife's a pediatrician. That's not part of the bio there. But one of the reasons I got so passionate about health care and why I was one of the I think only legislators, frankly, that read the Affordable Care Act um, was that uh, when I read it, I was concerned that it was more about control than it was about care. And I started, uh, that was one of the seeds that were planted to actually get me to run for office in the first place. That's why you heard that I never ran for as rep. Well, my wake up call into politics wasn't until about 2009, and I started seeing all the, all the policies that were being implemented by uh, President Obama. And uh, I decided we couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore. And my wife and I prayed a lot about it and ended up, uh, as we call it, kind of getting in the wheelbarrow. But it started on part of the wake up call, came around this health care issue. And I've been working on this for quite a while. In 2013, Michigan decided to start looking at this Medicaid expansion, if you may recall. And for those of you who don't recall, Medicaid expansion is actually section 2001 of H.R. 3590, which is affectionately known as Obamacare. Uh, a lot of people are saying, no, it had nothing to do with Obamacare. Well, I read it. Obamacare it is Section 2001 of Obamacare. And uh, the sad part is that um, Medicaid itself doesn't provide people with good care. It actually provides them with coverage. But the folks that were ostensibly trying to help in that um, don't receive the care that we'd like to think we're getting for $18.6 million a year. Uh, and uh, so I started exploring what were some of the alternatives to Medicaid expansion. And it kind of starts with a philosophical issue, and we were talking about that earlier, really, Mike. We were kind of saying there's two ways of going off and expanding access to quality care. One is to take money from one group of people and give it to another group of people and subsidize the cost of that care. The other is to try to lower the cost of health care for everyone. Well, I was focused in on that second route, and I wanted to make sure that we had options that were available. And I have a big passion, very passionate about free market options, whether it's health care, whether or not it's uh, economic development, or whether or not it's education, whatever the case may be, I'm a big advocate of the free market. And uh, I started looking around for options on that. And I, it wasn't until the, the, the uh, secret sauce, and what we're going to focus in on tonight, discuss is something called direct primary care services. And I found out about this by watching Huckabee one night on Fox News Channel. And he had these three doctors on talking about this direct primary care services. And I'm going, how the heck are they getting away with that under a bunch of care? And I uh, started doing my research, reading the Affordable Care Act, and and uh, and then I actually reached out to these docs and I said, how are you guys doing it? And one of the doctors was foolish enough to return my call. And it was Dr. Josh Umbear out of Wichita, Kansas. He has a company called Atlas MD. And our first phone call, I still remember, lasted about 45 minutes. And he walked me through all the reasons this is the best thing since sliced bread, what it's done to not only save money, but the way it saves money is not the way the government saves money on health care. The government saves money on health care by rationing. That's the way managed care providers do. They ration care. They find they hire a bunch of people that are very good at saying no. And the uh, um, way direct primary care does it, though, is by emphasizing preventive care and putting the emphasis up front on good care where you're not doing these fast food visits to your primary care physician where it's five minutes and a, and a cloud of dust. You actually spend quality time with them. They walk you through what's needed in order to get back into a healthy lifestyle. And what you find is that you spend money on that upfront cost or with the primary care and it keeps you out of the hospital, keeps you out of the chronic illnesses, and lowers the overall cost of health care on the order of 20 to 60%. We're going to talk about that tonight. So I just want to let you know this is kind of part of a journey for me. I was always trying to find that, that secret sauce that gets to that free market solution. And the more I dig into this the, and the more people that we've networked with, not just here in Michigan but across the nation, um, we found a lot, a lot of good things that we can go off and do, and we're going to have uh, Tammy's going to be here from uh, Christian Medishare to talk about one of the ways we can do that. I like to say that the best parts of the Affordable Care Act are the exemptions, and, uh, and, and sadly, it's true. All the stuff that really has been exempted and are where what actually works, and um, and 
one of those is a healthcare ministry called Christian MediShare. So, key concepts for tonight's discussion that I want to get across is that when I'm talking about health plans, it actually, I want to break it into two pieces, like I was talking about a little bit earlier. Primary care piece and a, and a catastrophic care piece. Primary care is where 80% of the transactions occur. That's when you go to your internal medicine doc, that's when you go to your pediatrician, that's when you go to your family practice doc. And uh, the catastrophic care is when you're getting into the catastrophic, uh, you're getting into the chronic illnesses or you get hit by a beer truck and have to go to the hospital. All right, that's the stuff that insurance used to be all about. Insurance used to be about expensive items that you could not handle with the the monthly or with the uh, annual checkups going to the doctor. And uh, so the primary focus of my talks historically is I usually talk about the direct primary care and, and I'm usually joined by a direct primary care doc by the name of uh, Dr. Chad Savage or, Chad, or John Blanchard or uh, Paul Thomas. There's some really good direct primary care docs out there in Michigan now. Um, and then uh, we'll talk a little about self-funded insurance, but uh, healthcare ministry sits into that catastrophic care side of the fence, and we're going to get to that a little bit later. Um, so, talks divided into primary care discussion, catastrophic care. All right, key concept I want to get across at the beginning that kind of puts some of these things in concept in, in context of where I'm coming from when I look at free market options and free market solutions. Um, this is first brought to my attention by a former congressman from Ohio, his name is uh, Bob McEwen. And, uh, but I later found out that actually Milt Friedman was one of the ones that was actually pushing this construct before Bob McEwen ever was, but I want to make sure I get credit where credit's due. So, if you look at different types of economic transactions, we're going to break it into a first party, second party, and third party transaction. A first party transaction would be you buy something with your own money for yourself. You're concerned about cost, and you're also concerned about quality. Second party transaction. Well, I'm concerned about uh, I'm, def I'm concerned about cost. So this is where I buy something for somebody else with my own money. I'm concerned about cost, but quality sometimes it just has to pass the sniff test. Unfortunately, there's a reason why people uh, coined the term regifting, right? Yes. Now, third party transaction or a third person transaction is when you're buying something for someone else using someone else's money. You're not really concerned about the cost, you're not really concerned about the quality, um, unless you have a virtuous you know, person that's actually conducting that. And uh, the sad part is, all government transactions are third party transactions. And so when a lot of people talk about you gotta separate social and fiscal issues, Really, you can't, not if you really want to be fiscally responsible. Because the only way you get high, uh, a, a, a uh, high importance associated with cost, high importance associated with quality, is if you have somebody in government, acting as a public servant, that's, willing, that's looking at their service as loving your neighbor as yourself. So in other words, converting that third person transaction into a first person transaction. And I don't know if you've looked around, with notable exception of uh, former Representative John Bumstead, but there's not a lot of folks that are loving their neighbors as themselves up in, in public service nowadays. And uh, so, uh, that drives the need for first party transactions. Now, under this third party transaction model, or third person transaction model, we see the essentially almost a, a exponential growth in the cost of health care. And I want to point out that that exponential growth is not driven by the number of physicians that are getting out there. It's driven by the number of administrators that are sensibly put in there to make sure that we're providing quality services at a low cost to all of our citizens. All right? So this is how government tries to make up for the fact that they're not doing so good on those third-person transactions. They throw in a bunch of administrators who require a lot of reports. And next thing you know is all those health care dollars are going to feed people that aren't providing health care. So um, this is just going up to 2009. I can assure you that since 2009, the Affordable Care Act introduces 159 new organizations between a doctor and a patient. Do you think that those 159 organizations are going to lower the cost of health care? Do you think they're going to improve the quality because those bureaucrats know a heck of a lot more about what the health care needs of a patient than a doctor? No, so they're not going to be helping out on cost or quality. Yet. Uh, that's what we're led to believe some days. So I'm going to go in and let's look at what are our first 
third-party transactions that you see in primary care. So under the Affordable Care Act, um, what you've got are, under a traditional insurance program, you've got independent insurance based practices, you've got managed care organizations, you've got hospital-based care, all these are pretty much third-party transactions. If you go and say, hey, I don't want insurance anymore, and direct primary care services, just you know, it's like healthcare ministries it are not insurance, it's actually a service. So the uh, analogy is if you're, um, when you own a car, you also will probably have car insurance if you live in the state of Michigan, but you don't use your car insurance to go pay for your oil changes. You don't use your car insurance to go fill up the tank with gas, right? Um, same thing here, direct primary care services, these are kind of routine medical visits that you go to a primary care physician. Um, you can also go cash services, so you can do fee for service and go off and ask for the like, cash basis for a lot of your primary care services. So those are pretty much the two primary, uh, or the uh, first person transactions available to you under primary care right now. Under catastrophic care, it gets a little bit more complicated because one thing to point out that traditional what insurance used to be about risk management, now it's about health management. So it's, it's much more comprehensive. They want to take care of every last aspect of life so that they, they ostensibly, somebody on high is going off and mitigating the risk of these higher costs. And uh, so in order to do that, they need a lot of information and uh, telling you what you can or can't do in regards to the type of life, that you, lifestyle that you can go off and leave. So uh, the basic categories that you see here under catastrophic care, under the auspices of the Affordable Care Act, are first of all under the column of qualified health plan. Qualified health plan is an important term in Section 1301 of the Affordable Care Act because if you have a qualified health plan, the folks at the IRS can't come knocking on your door in the middle of the night and saying you, and with their palms out, saying you owe taxes and you owe a penalty because you haven't met the minimum essential benefit requirements associated with the Affordable Care Act. So, under a qualified health plan, there's a variety of different approaches on it. One is the exchange based plans. You guys have all heard about healthcare.gov, you know. Place where if you like your insurance, you can keep your insurance. Um, those are for for profit insurers, and I think it's important to note that a lot of these for profit insurers are actually disappearing off the exchange. Um, more and more of them are going out of, I, you know, some of them are going out of business, but a lot of them are just saying it's not worth our effort to so put ourselves up on that exchange. There's also uh, what they call consumer operated and oriented plans, those are essentially the Nonprofit insurers, so there are these co op ideas under the Affordable Care Act. All of those, whenever they've been tried, have been going belly up across the country. Um, and then there's the community health insurance, i.e., the single payer. This is where the government is actually the, the insurer. Um, and uh, uh, that's already baked into the Affordable Care Act under Section 1301 as different plans that fit the qualified health plan uh, definition. The last item here is something I want to talk about a little bit tonight, and it's called self-funded insurance. And, and what's done in the Affordable Care Act, it says that it's not really technically a pure exemption, but they say that if you want to self-fund your insurance as an employer, for example, you, as long as you comply with federal ERISA guidelines, which are employee, employee retirement, uh, I don't remember what the ISA stands for, but they're, um, if you, as long as you comply with the rules and regulations associated with that, that will qualify as a qualified health plan as well. That's not a bad option. I won't call that a first party, uh, first person transaction, second person, but um, there are some benefits associated with that. We're gonna go through that tonight. Um, oh, you all know about Medicaid and Medicare. Both of those are treated under the blanket of CMS um, in the federal government, which is a department within the overall federal health and human services department. Um, there's some important topics to discuss in particular around Medicaid that I want to get to a little bit. Um, but really, when you're looking at first party transactions, you have to look to the exemptions, which is where Tammy fits in, on, on the uh, um, on healthcare sharing ministries. And Christian MediShare is one of four or five, I think, that are available right now, five. Um, we've had one of them talk with us at one of these town halls before, it was Kiro. But tonight you're going to hear about uh, Christian MediShare. And then, of course, you can always go to the open market and cash services. And just to plant a seed on why that's becoming more and more attractive in the era of $5,000 deductibles is, uh, is that you've got groups like um, Surgery Center of Oklahoma. How many of you guys have ever heard of that organization? 
Um, if you get a chance after this session is done, go to surgerycenterok.com and you go to that website and the first thing you see is the anatomy of the human body. You can take your mouse, click on any part of the human body and it'll pop up a list of surgical procedures that, you, that they provide at this surgery center. And what they will provide is the out-the-door pricing for that surgical procedure. When's the last time you went to a hospital and they told you before you went in what the out-the-door price was of that medical treatment? So there are some serious options on it. And by the way, those prices are about 90% lower than what you would find in a traditional insurance environment. So I'm listing that because for some people it may actually, with a five or ten thousand dollar deductible, it may be cheaper to buy a plane ticket, spend it, to go to Oklahoma, get the surgery there, and come back. Um, so it's something to consider. All right. So why does free market healthcare reform matter to me so much? Um, I kind of look at it as government Swiss Army knife. There's a lot of things that it, a lot of things that it fixes. Not only does it provide better healthcare opportunities for our citizens, but I look at it from a fiduciary perspective and serving in state government and making sure that we're getting the best bang for the buck for taxpayer dollars. There's a lot of opportunities to go out, save taxpayers money, while actually providing better services. And one of the ways of doing that, in particular, is around the Medicaid budget. So I was probably one of the biggest opponents to the Medicaid expansion, especially in the Senate. Um, and uh, because it was going to bankrupt us. And oh, by the way, as a side note, um, how many of you guys know that uh, Healthy Michigan is in a death spiral right now? How many of you heard that it's the greatest thing since sliced bread and it's a huge success? All right, well, there's a little known provision inside of that Healthy Michigan plan that uh, uh, says that once the federal government contributions fall below 100%, and once we demonstrate that we're no longer saving money as a state, Healthy Michigan is automatically repealed. According to Senate Fiscal, that event occurs in 2020. There's a lot of people trying to say that, oh, the reason Healthy Michigan's in trouble is because the federal government's threatening to repeal Obamacare. Au contraire. <laughs> it is already in a death spiral with or without the AHCA or whatever else they come up with in the wake of this. And I want to make sure people understand that. That is a very important concept. There's people who are going to be trying to to sell us on the fact that they, um, the, uh, it's the repeal of Obamacare that threatens Healthy Michigan. No, Healthy Michigan is what is threatening Healthy Michigan. So please understand that. And by the way, um, if you want to talk about that road tax that was passed, or that they uh, passed a while back, and they, they said that we needed to increase the taxes for the roads, um, please understand that that was always about backfilling potholes and the assumptions on Medicaid expansion, not on our roads. Because immediately after they passed that tax increase for the roads, the $400 million in general fund that had been allocated to fix our roads and transportation budget was taken out and allocated to things like Medicaid expansion. So it was a bait and switch. So, by the way, do you know why I don't have any chairmanships this year? <laughs> um, actually, Medicaid expansion was one of the reasons, my vocal opposition to it was one of the reasons cited. So, um, it's very frustrating. But here's the opportunity on Medicaid now. So, and I'm thankful we're getting some traction on it this year. Um, I'm a big advocate of trying to combine direct primary care with a wraparound insurance product for Medicaid enrollees. The biggest problem a lot of Medicaid enrollees have is that they can't get access to a primary care physician. And when they do get access to a primary care physician, they have what I like to call a scarlet M. You guys know the scarlet letter, right? Instead of an A, it's an M. Because as soon as the doctor sees that you have Medicaid, they realize that they're only going to get 47 cents on the dollar from the federal government in reimbursement. And you can't have a whole business when you're operating at a loss for all of your patients. You have to cut your losses. You have to go up and cap the number of enrollees you have. And if you don't cap it, you're going to stretch it out as much as possible so that it turns into an effective rationing of care because you can't afford to see them on a regular basis. Um, and so they end up getting poor quality care. Matter of fact, I don't know if you knew this, but Medicaid enrollees actually see the ER at three times a clip of not of private insurance or non-insured people because they can't get access to a primary care physician. Direct primary care, we don't. There is no scarlet letter anymore. They get a dollar for a dollar, essentially. So when 
they, there's no difference between a Medicaid and enrollee and a, um, uh, and a private insurer or a private citizen coming in there. Um, this is a case where uh, it truly does give people the care that they need. And I know a lot of direct primary care docs that actually have Medicaid patients going to them. They're willing to pay out of pocket an additional $50 per month just so they can have access to a primary care physician. The opportunity in Michigan, though, DPC has been demonstrated to save up to 20%, or actually over 20% on health care costs, total cost of health care. And we got an $18.6 billion budget in the state for, Michigan, for Medicaid right now, out of a $56.3 billion budget. It's by far the single largest line item in our state budget. 20% saving on that is $3.7 billion. So if you also know why I'm a big advocate of saying we don't need to increase taxes for roads, if we were to go off and deploy this, out of that $3.7 billion, one and a half billion of it is state funds. That could be freed up to more than compensate for the $1.2 billion tax increase they were looking for for roads. That makes sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. All right, so, the, uh, so we're putting out a pilot that's targeted right now at just 2,400 enrollees. If it proves out and validates the assertions that I've been making and others have made around savings around uh, direct primary care, we could extend it to all 2.4 million Michigan citizens. When we do that, we're going to save at least $3.7 billion annually. By the way, that is a lowball number from my perspective. That is not a um, pine the sky because I think we can get the savings up near 50 or 60 percent from some of the conditions that I've seen. So, anyway, we still, it's not something that happened overnight. That's why we're starting out small because we've got maybe a dozen direct primary care docs in the state right now and they can't see two. So, uh, so it's a, but it is a start. We need to indicate that that's the direction we want to have. The other opportunity is around public employers. So, state government, um, local units of government. Uh, the gentleman was talking, Jim, talking about uh, uh, OPEP as one of the biggest, uh, which means other post employment benefits, health care benefits for retirees. Well, that's a big burden on local governments right now. Those payments are uh, pretty expensive. So if you can lower the total cost of health care, well, you've effectively lowered your liabilities by over 20% as well. And now you can free up funds for things like roads, more police, more fire, you know, more, uh, more teachers in the classroom. There's a lot of opportunities when you start looking at um, applying this model to uh, take care of the health care costs for public Here's one of the most fun areas of, it gets into what happens in the private market, the private employers. Now we spend about $35 billion annually on healthcare for private employers. 20% off of that, $7 billion. What do you think a $7 billion reduction in the cost of doing business in the state of Michigan would do to job growth in the state? Do you think more companies would flock to Michigan? Do you think we'd actually get some bridge traffic from the Canadians? Um, it's actually something that uh, you know can translate into either more jobs, translate into higher paying jobs, or translate into uh, a more competitive uh, workforce and more competitive com companies here in the state of Michigan. We will be, in the words of Ovik Roy, one of the leaders in healthcare nationally, um, uh, we'll be the center of a free market healthcare revolution right here in Michigan. So that's why I'm on this evangelism tour. I want to tell what the possibilities are in this. This touches so many different aspects of our lives that um, it's important to get it out to everybody. So let's zero in specifically on direct primary care. I keep using that term, but I haven't really delved into detail about what it actually is, right? So first, look at what's going on in primary care and the insurance-based um, in, in practices right now. We've got a case where, and I can attest to this with my wife uh, being a pediatrician, um, they're overworked, but I think this last survey that I saw done on primary care physicians is that over 83% of them, if they could get out and uh, of medicine right now, they would, right? <laughs> Definitely. And uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of job satisfaction. And when you go into the med schools and you start talking to the uh, docs that go in all bright eyed and bushy tail saying, I want to be a primary care physician. Almost all of them are saying, uh, yeah, you know, I started doing some calculations on paying off my med school loans, and I'm going, I can't, I can't pay them off in a reasonable time frame unless I go into a specialty and actually start making a little bit more money than you get in primary care. Um, so there's, a, there's some problems with the incentive model around primary care right now. Not a lot of happy docs, 
And um, I, uh, you've probably seen the long waits for care. I mean, you know, if you want, if you got cold and sniffle, sometimes it's, you have to wait a week or two weeks just to get into the dock now. Um, and uh, in Canada, it can be even worse. <laughs> There's also conflicts of interest because their docs are graded on certain metrics that may, not or may or may not be in the best interest of the patients. Um, my wife used to uh, like to prescribe Biaxin for her kids um, because they only have to take it twice a day, for, and which for parents struggling to get kids to take medicine is kind of a big deal, but she was encouraged to give them erythromycin. They had to take that four times a day. How do you keep a kid in the seat for a, to, at the same time and get a hold of them to get four different so you'd actually end up not doing a good job with the antibiotics in that case. So um, they've got some very squirrely metrics that are not necessarily in the best interest of patients. So in the DPC model, um, it's a little bit different than a traditional practice. Traditional practice, three physicians are gonna have about five to seven support people in the back office handling accounts receivable. Uh, direct primary care uh, uh, practices, Sometimes they don't have anybody in the back office, um, and it would just be the docs that are, that are practicing. Sometimes you may have a nurse doubling, doing triage plus taking appointments, and that's about it. Um, essentially, what it means, typical direct primary care agreement involves unlimited office visits. It involves um, in, in, in office diagnostics, things like blood tests, things like uh, EKG sometimes, and, and whatever the doc feels comfortable going off and, and getting a good deal on, a good price on, they include it in the scope of their services. Um, a lot of office procedures, a lot of them will offer wholesale rates on prescription drugs, which is a big savings in cost. And then it also opens the door to telemedicine. So um, it's not unheard of for, uh, you don't have to go into the office visit to actually get, get the uh, doctor to talk to you. Right now, under traditional care, you have to do that because the only way the doctor gets compensated from the insurance company is if it's an in-office visit. But under direct primary care, they can you can call them up. You can if you're walking through the woods and you're brush up against some poison ivy, you can take a picture of it, text the doc, and they can say, "Yep, you got poison ivy. Oops, better put some calamine lotion on or whatever they do," and um, and they'll tell you everything you need to do without ever going into the into the doc. Um, you don't have that opportunity under a traditional insurance model. This is, uh, we don't, a lot of insurance companies have standards of uh, operating procedures that you have to comply with in order to get compensated. You have things like CPT coding, which um, under ICD-10, there's like 68,000 codes or something like that, 83,000 I think it is, or something like that, that doctors have to memorize and classify each one of uh, their treatments so that they can get reimbursed from the uh, insurance company. And these are getting kind of ridiculous with some of these codes, by the way. You actually, instead of just saying this person has a broken arm, you need to know whether or not he got a broken arm because they got hit by a falling space debris, or they got sucked into a jet engine twice. I mean, literally, they're getting down into that level of granularity on it. So if you're wondering why things take so long, 50% of the time now on the uh, primary care visits is actually spent doing coding and administrative work. It's not spent actually doing um, treatment for the patient. And so, how much does it cost for this? Well, a lot of the docs that you'll see will actually stratify their uh, cost structure for direct primary care um, based on age. This is the pricing from uh, Dr. Chad Savage out of Your Choice Direct Care on Brighton. And it scales from $39 up to $69 for um, seven year involvement. Because you spend more time, the older you get, the more time you took as, as I'm getting past 50 here and I'm spending more time in the doctor's office myself lately. I get an appreciation for that. So the nice thing about the DPC characteristics is that you got a reasonable patient load. Instead of a panel size of 2,500 to 3,500 in a traditional insurance-based practice, um, your patient load is around 600. And so that opens it up to rural communities a heck of a lot more than traditional insurance practices. Um, you uh, have unencumbered care, frankly, this is what primary care docs got into medicine for in the first place. Do you remember the old Norman Rockwell painting with the doctors taking care of the patient? Well, that's what direct primary care is. You're not worrying about insurance forms. You're not worrying about electronic medical records. You're focused on taking care of the patient. So I routinely get flash mob when I talk about this to med schools for all these um, budding new physicians that have been uh, 
starting their clinical rotations and they realize that they maybe did not pick the best career choice because they see the bleary eyes of the docs that they're dealing with and they're going, this is just not a good choice for me. They come out afterwards saying, I have renewed hope now that this is a practice model. This is why I wanted to get into medicine and they get excited again. And a lot more of them are going to be in primary care than specialty care um, with this model being available to them. Um, so how does it reduce money? I'm not going to go into all the details on this. It's, this is where Chad Savage, who actually works on it, can give you a little bit better impression of it. But I just want to highlight there's some key things. First of all, for billing, I talked about the accounts receivable difference, right? There's no accounts receivable issue on this. A lot of docs right now in traditional insurance will have accounts receivable in the order of six months or longer before they actually get compensated for care that was delivered. Under a DPC model, um, you actually get compensated on a month to month basis. It's just like a cell phone bill. You pay for the coverage, um, uh, that, or you pay for the service that you're going to get at the end of the month. It says, uh, and except in this case, it doesn't, the payment doesn't change. You get a monthly fee, standard monthly fee every month. And so um, there is no need to go off and wait for an invoice on it. You're just, you're on recurring payments, if you will, on it. And that keeps the overhead extremely low for the docs. Um, you got better access. Well, if you got better access and you're spending more time with the patients, you're going to keep them out of the ER. One study that was done by Q Lions, which is a group out in uh, west coast of Michigan, or west coast of the United States, um, showed that you're spending 50% less time in the hospital. Now, hospital visits for, for two nights in a hospital, you can easily pay about $36,000. So, easily, you know, you pay for quite a few years of direct primary care services for that amount of money. Um, they've got low cost labs. So, when the doctors start dealing directly with some of the suppliers for this, you start getting significant discounts. So, this is this an example for a CBC. Uh, uh, count, um, sub look on, uh, uh, and you can see that we saved about 90% on that. This is one of the examples that Chad talks about. Low cost imaging, MRIs in our state with the certificate of need, which is another topic for another day. Um, MRIs can cost as much as $3,400. Uh, under a direct primary care agreement, you can get it for as low as $275. Um, medications huge opportunity for savings and then frankly that's one of the highest inflationary parts of medical uh, services today is around prescriptions. They're on the order of a, about an annual increase around 25 percent. Um, well, under this model, if you go direct with the wholesale providers of uh, drugs, a lot of, of direct primary care docs will operate a pharmacy out of their office, you can get significant reduction on the cost of meds. So, I'm going to roll this up into the big picture to, to show you why I'm so excited and why I'm on this evangelism tour. Let's look at this uh, typical profile of a 58-year-old diabetic with some other complications like pneumonia and chest pain. All right? So under the Affordable Care Act, you can get gold, silver, platinum, bronze plans, right? Different insurance plans. And really all they are is a function of how much risk are you going to assume versus the insurer. And uh, so how much of it's going to be cost sharing? So under a goal plan, you have some cost sharing responsibility, but the majority of your coverage is paid for in the premium. And so under this example, uh, this individual will be paying about $13,000 in change for their premiums for a gold insurance plan. Their out-of-pocket cost would be almost $1,000. So a total of around $14,000 for this. This is the gold plan under the Affordable Care Act. You go down to the next step and say, hey, maybe I can save some money if I just do a little bit more out-of-pocket costs and go down the ground plan. Well, your premium drops down to $6,000 and change, um, but your out-of-pocket costs go up to about $4,700. So for the sake of simplicity, we've just saved, though, overall about $4,000. So it went from $14,000 to $10,000 just from switching from a goal to a bronze plan. Now what if I went the next distance and I said, you know, this, this bronze plan with these $5,000, $10,000 deductible is really ain't floating my boat. Let's go off and replace, uh, and, and instead I'll ignore that deductible. I'm going to go in and get a direct primary care service agreement instead of paying the cost sharing provisions under the traditional insurance. Well, the pri direct primary care is going to cost about $830 a year, um, and the uh, premium is the same as it was before, about $7,400 in this case, sorry. Um, and so you're talking about what, a little over $8,000, about $8,200. So you've gone from $14,000 down to $8,200. Now, 
But this is where things get exciting. That's why it's exciting to have Tammy here tonight, too. Is that if you were to couple that direct primary care services with a Christian MediShare program, now you're talking about about $3,300 a year. So you went from $14,000 down to $3,300. So if you don't think that there's fat to be trimmed in our healthcare uh, costs right now, um, you're not looking at the numbers. There's a lot of opportunities to reduce and trim the fat in here. Just And the way you do it is not by rationing care and saying no. You do it by focusing on getting people better care. So let's look at that cash rock. Now we've teed it up for a discussion of some of the cash rocks. I want to talk a little about self fund insurance, and we're going to hand it over to Tammy to talk specifically about Christian MediShare. All right. So under traditional insurance, you know, when you when you get a fully insured plan, you've got a company that pays a premium to insurance care carrier who ends up paying the claims on your behalf. Uh, the insurance carrier is one who assumes all the risk, and uh, if you undershoot on your claims assumptions, they also pocket all the, the difference in the form of profit. Um, so, I think annual average premium for a, for a single individual is around $6,200, and for families, we're talking about $17,000 a year in coverage. So, I'm assuming that that's pretty close to what a lot of you are seeing on the, on the market here. Um, that's a lot of money, and it wasn't that much just a few years ago. Um, if you go to self-funded insurance, well now, this is for small and mid-sized employers in particular. Um, essentially, the employer assumes the risk associated with these claims. So if they overshoot, they're the ones who assume the risk. Um, so the claims are 100% funded by the employer. And in 2015, 63% um, of all workers, regardless of employer size, and 83% of large employers were covered by self-funded insurance. Larger companies in particular do this because they've got teams of administrative experts that know how to save money for those companies. Small and mid-sized businesses, adoption rates a little bit slower because it's tough to go off and navigate through all of this bureaucracy, for the lack of a better term. Um, but the, the potential for significantly lower costs because what happens is that the employer designs a plan based around their employees. Um, they don't have to worry about the minimum essential health benefits. They've got to comply with the guidelines associated with ERISA. There's no premium tax, and they're protected on upside around the claims uh, by whenever you, by, uh, if, from having too many or claims that exceed your forecast, usually with an incorporation of what they call stop loss insurance. So that limits their upside risk. Um, so in general, this is a good deal for employers. Let's get down into the numbers a little bit. So under a traditional insurance model, let's just say there's a, this is a company uh, with about, I think it's about 112 employees. This is actually real data. It's all been sanitized to, to protect the HIPAA violations, if you will. But these are real numbers. Um, a, uh, you, typically, you would pay about 600 for this company. They would pay about $690,000 in claims, um, and uh, uh, the insurance company pocketed about $280,000 in addition to that in profit. So you pay your premium, um, and of that amount, $690,000 that went to the insurance company would go to claims. The rest went to their pocket. Under a self-funded insurance plan, what you do in is now you're breaking up, you get still the same number of claims that happen, but instead of $120,000 of that is actually going to go into the pocket of the employer, either to be used to put off in the savings, either to be used as employee bonuses, whatever the employer wants to use it for, they can use it for. Another $130,000 might go to a stop loss insurance program, so it keeps them from from that risk of an upside risk kind of claim. So if that 690000 this year actually turned into double that amount the next year, you'd be limited in your liability because you purchase a stop loss insurance. You see, and then you'd add something called a third party administrator. And the third party administrator who's actually a service provider that you hire to specifically pay your claims. So the CEO or general manager doesn't have to do that. You hire somebody that's specialized in paying these medical claims and they would actually be compensated to do that. And like we said, the claims is the same. But then the nice thing about this is you just pocketed $120,000 that before went directly to the insurance company. So you go to self-funded plus direct primary care, now you get some even more savings because now all of a sudden those claim that claim number starts decreasing. They actually saw that drop from $690,000 to $493,000. In some cases, it's not because they have a lot of uh, 
it's not because they have necessarily a reduction in some of the services that they need. It's just that most of those services are then covered under the direct primary care contract, and you don't have to submit a claim out to, out to um, provide a third-party uh, provider. And so overall, the net savings, when you actually go down this line, and, uh, is under traditional, if you were to pay $970,000, under direct primary care plus self-funded, you're starting to see savings on the order of $317,000, or about a 68%, I mean, or sorry, 32%. Uh, savings on that. Um, so there's there's some opportunities for small and mid-sized employers to take advantage of this, um, and I want to make sure you're aware.